I get a bet. Oh man, I bet you can't. Uh, you know, beat this this capture the flag. I'm like, ah, oh, I beat it. Smash it. He's like, oh, it's for college students. I knew you would beat it. I'm surprised you didn't hack the thing that it was running on. I'm like, is that a challenge? He's like, yeah. So the system that it was running on was a Mac Pro. Mind you, I told you, I know about like this Wi-Fi pineapple stuff, these key loggers, land turtles, mm-hmm. all this shit, right? So it's sitting there. I'm just like, bro, I bet you, I bet you I could get that computer to connect to my computer. It was a reverse shell. We just got to be on the same network. And I'm on the same network because I signed up for the capture the flag. Right. And I understand IP addresses enough. I understand routing enough. So I'm, you know, okay. I know how to, you know, I know how this works. I know the IP address of the server and everything, right? So I get a payload written for my rubber ducky and I put it onto that box, right? And it fires off and it gives me the reverse shell. Ooh, I catch it. I know, and I got witnesses, right? I got homies who just there with me. Hey, they not really, listen. they not really knowing like what I know how to. Do. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Textual Talk. Where I'm your host, Ace D. But we talk about tech, life, career, money, you name it. We talk about everything. This is episode number forty-five. Man, hey, appreciate everybody. Y'all really been supporting the channel. We got a special guest for y'all today, guys. His name is Xavier Johnson. He's really doing his thing in the tech world. He's an entrepreneur. He's offensive security guru. He, he, listen, y'all are in for a treat, man. I'm telling you right now. But um, y'all didn't come to hear me talk. Y'all came to hear him. So without further ado, let's welcome my guest. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mr. Xavier Johnson. He's a cybersecurity professional, and he also runs his own company. And I believe it's called, I don't want to butcher it, but I believe it's We Help Secure. We Help You Secure. We help you secure. There we go. There we go. You know, just got to add the little you in there. But um, I appreciate them for uh, tapping in with us today, man. This is actually like, you know, we're doing this midday. It's the first. So we're going to see how this go. But um, appreciate you, man, for uh, tapping in with me today. Can you tell the people a little bit about yourself real quick? Yeah, man. So my name is Xavier D. Johnson. Um, I've been in tech for about 20 years, approaching 20 years now. Um been in cybersecurity for the last eight, maybe approaching 10 years now. Um, but yeah, uh, that's a little bit about me. I, I started my first software company um, in 2010. Uh, it was called Infinite Development Solutions. It really started off as a web development company, grew into an app development company. Uh, from there, I sold that company, went and worked for General Motors, General Electric, spent some time over at Dynatrace, uh, helped out a couple of other people doing some contract work um and yeah but since then i've uh i kind of left corporate and started to work on uh we help you secure originally it was known as enterprise offensive security and then uh, i got a nasty gram from uh, the folks over at offensive dash security uh, claiming that they were providing these services as well so uh, we rebranded recently to we help you secure All right, cool, man. That's that's pretty dope. Um, shoot, we around like um, around the same age, I believe. I just made thirty. Oh, how old are you? I just made thirty two months ago. Oh, okay, okay, that's what's up. No, man. actually, I think it's almost three months ago. It's June already. I'm, I'm still thinking it's May. But yeah, yeah, I'm, I just uh, made thirty. I'll be thirty one this year. So yeah. Okay, that's a bet. It's funny because um, when I was listening to like your your first part of like the spiel with your first company. Uh, it would sounded like something um, one of your fellow Detroiters said on a um, um, this YouTube channel. I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Pocket Watching with JT. You familiar with him? Oh man, he sounds yeah yeah yeah. He sounds so familiar. I'm trying to remember why I know him yeah. though. He, he do uh, jumping off the porch? Nah, he just so most of the time react to like different like people that's like talking about finance and stuff like on YouTube mm. or TikTok or whatever and kind of break it down he's like an accountant and a certified i think financial planner but anyway he yeah. had one of your fellow uh pandemic superstars from detroit on his channel not too long ago uh anton daniels okay i don't know if, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not no no not not specifically got you you don't really need to be but he said something about he had some type of company and 
they did some with mixed text. I don't know. We couldn't really find anything that was, you know, verified by that. But that was just funny. That's what I just thought about. I was like, what if he taking points from other people? Mm. But um, that's pretty dope, man. So what we'll do is uh, briefly, because like you're actually like the second or no, I think you might be like third person I had from like Detroit um, on a channel. Uh, I had shout out to uh, Delane Roberts and Master IT. And then I had a uh, jury early on in the, in the podcast. I believe she was from Detroit too. So, you know, shout out to Detroit. Um, Detroit? What's up? I've, uh, I met a couple of y'all like in person, like from people from Detroit and they cool. They remind me, I'm from Louisiana. Uh, so they remind me from people back home in Shreveport. So uh, gotcha. shout out to y'all. But uh, how, how was growing up in like Detroit and also like jumping right into the, like the tech space or like, you know, at a young age, like how, how were you able to do that? And like, how was like, um, I guess like I'll say, what influenced you to do that? Like early on, especially yeah. like from a city, like we know Detroit is like the motor city known for like, I don't do stuff like that, but like, it's not necessarily known for like, you know, tech things. So like how, you know, what made you kind of want to do that? Well, funny enough, um, I got really lucky. I got really, really lucky. Um, but Detroit definitely known for tech things. Now, come on, bro. Highly technical people, very, very skilled, uh, skilled and unskilled labor in Detroit. Um, the automotive industry is is what we're mostly known for, but also Motown Records, right? So we always got the edge of, of kind of innovation, style, art, design. Um, and, you know, I was born in 91, so by the time I came up, a lot of that heyday had passed us, but... Um, there's still a great spirit in Detroit that is around creating, being a creative, um, and everything in between, right? So, uh, kind of just coming up, I've always saw, you know, things that were just fly and and, and fast and cool, like it just caught like nice cars alligator shoes, Cartier glasses, minks, like that type of stuff is just really Detroit culture, right? So I always hold on, hold grew on. up. Before you keep on going, you say what you're saying is you got a pair of buffs? Oh, come on now. They're my prescription glasses. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you keep rocking though. But yeah, so, you know, you know, the buffies, everything, right? So Detroit just always had nice things. Um, people in Detroit, you know, been getting it for a while. Um, a little bit of background about Detroit. It's like 600, almost 700,000 people in Detroit right now. And uh, it's like 80% maybe 70 something percent black, right? So um, large black population in Detroit, uh, great like culture there feels like at home uh, to me, you know? And so um, growing up, I saw like both ends of the spectrum. Um, I had a young mom, so, you know, my background kind of like, we kind of grew up together, so to speak. Uh, she's like 20 years older than me. so. I always felt like I had like an older sibling more than a mom and she kind of guided me through life. But I kind of saw her, you know, accumulate her wealth and, and do her thing in life. And that kind of inspired me as well. And so, you know, some of the connections and relationships that she was able to garner over time were able to influence me. Um, so like my godmom um, was a multimillionaire and, you know, she had a lot, you know, a lot of possessions, but one of the things I think that was coolest about her was she's a minority woman and she worked in a predominantly white male dominated industry and she married a white man, but he worked for her. And I just always thought that that was the coolest thing. I'm like, man, like I really want to be able to be in business one day. Um, so I always had this like attraction to business. And my, uh, my uncle Paul, you know, growing up, he always, you know, kept computers around funny enough. He, uh, he got into computers through Focus Hope. And that will kind of circle back around to something that, you know, I talked about later on with regard to my nonprofit and the academy and training people. But um, my uncle, you know, got his certification for, for computers through Focus Hope and always just had computers around. Um, so I grew up with computers in the house. Some of my earliest memories is on computers. I think uh, like when I was five years old, I got my first computer, which saying a lot for, you know, a young black kid in Detroit. Um, so, yeah, man, uh, just really got lucky, like circumstance, right? Like, you know, was able to see 
you know, my kids on my block and go run and hop fences and get chased by dogs and, you know, fight and gamble and everything else that kids do, but then also at home have some structure. And, you know what I'm saying, was, you know, was, was in a position where I was able to be exposed to things and see things that I could attain to want to have, you know, that I could dream to attain one day. Yeah. That's dope, man. I'm uh give your your god mom this right here. Put some respect on my name. For real. You know what I'm saying? Y'all say my name, put some respect on it. For real. Julie that's Brown. Dope, man. Yeah. Who? Julie Brown, Plastech, P L A S T E C H. That Julie Brown. I'm definitely gonna yeah. go back through this and uh do that. I should have clipped that, but I'm gonna do it right here. Um that's dope because as I got I've gotten older. I've always said one of the best things for kids, especially black kids, is exposure. Um, I know, like, when I was younger, and granted, I ain't grew up in no projects or nothing, whatever, but it's just, like, it's just different when you start seeing the different mindsets of of different people, especially different black people. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. some black people got, like, the lack mindset or they always complaining. They not figuring out, like, how they can go to the next level. And, um... I think I kind of grew up in like a family that was more so content. Um, and I, I mean, that's a, I, I ain't gonna say it's a bad thing. I mean, it's like, ain't like I just, you know, was like thinking about where my next meal was going, but I'll say that it did help me realize what I didn't want to do as I became an adult, mm-hmm. which is why like I ended up going to school and figuring out, Hey, you know, what major is going to make, you know, money got a good upside of making money and not like some useless major. But, <laughs> You know, the things I used to think even doing my major about like, oh, I want to make you know, X amount of money at whatever age was still like low thinking just because I hadn't really, I, I think I had been exposed to probably like one person that had some money and that was like one of my uncle's friends who I think had like some type of, uh, I don't know exactly what he did with Merrill Lynch, but he worked with Merrill Lynch and he, you know, he made money. But other than that, I didn't really know anybody, you know, what my uncle did too, I guess, because he used to. He was a good networker for Nessa, so that brought him opportunities. So I said, I guess I technically learned from him, but not as much as I would have, like if he was like somebody I would spend time with like all the time. But it wasn't until I kind of moved to Texas to where I was like, you know, where I've been kind of like thinking so small. I just started, uh, I moved out here like six years ago and was staying with my aunt at the time, but she stayed in a good neighborhood. And then I just kind of like, you know, my mindset started changing like towards things I want and things I want to see every day. And mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things where like certain people, you know, most of the time, if you start off in the bottom, you're possibly going, to, you know, do the same thing with your kids because like what y'all going to think or be happy for, like, you know, we see the people like our people that's like, you know, they don't know nothing but government assistance or they get the the money and then, you know, the kids got the newest J's or like stuff like that is important to them, but they don't really own nothing. You know, they just always going to do section eight in the projects and stuff like that. And that's cool. Them crown bits, you know, tools. But yeah. then you you get the other subset of people that actually go get to experience some stuff. And then they say, oh, so I can actually do this. And it's not as hard as we make it out the scene. Right. You just got to put the work in and network and meet the right people. Just do the same thing that the other, you know, the other type of races of people been doing. So that's dope. I can definitely see like how you're able to be at where you're at now. Cause you just, it's like, this isn't foreign to you. It's like something you expect. Right. Exposure is everything. Uh, that's very, very, very important. Um, you know, being able to see things that um, that you can maybe attain one day allows you to be able to lock in and focus. Be able to say, okay, you know, in Detroit, <clears throat> for my generation, it was BMF, bro. You know, there's a lot of people who was the key. Shout out to Beach and Terry. Come on now, and YBI, and they was their aunties and uncles, and you know, their brothers, their moms, their dads. So. It was a flood where, you know, people was getting money, but just in a different way. So that mindset of just getting it, how you live in Detroit is there. And I spent some time, you know, I I was a party promoter. I had a party bus company when I was a partner in. I used to drive party buses. You know what I'm saying? I hustled. Okay, you you, was 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 getting in. You know, I actually, you know, I I worked at pizza places. I used to, (laughs) I dropped your engine out your car, man. I I was, I've always been a hustler. Money, you know, been important to me because I know what it does. Money always to me, at a very young age, I learned that money was a lubrication. It just allowed for things to to move. It allowed for stuff to be in motion. That's what it, that's what it takes. You need money. So, um, 
you know, no matter what it took to get it, if I had to throw parties, if I had to fly her at the mall, fly her at the after hours, if I had to, you know, cut hair, whatever it was, I, I you got to run it up. So and that really led to to me, you know, making a decision after high school not to go to college and just decide, you know, I wanted to go directly into my career and do something that was, you know, traditional for what my peers did. And at that time, I looked at my peers as Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, um, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates. And when you look at those people, they don't have traditional routes into their career pathways and they, they own their own destinies and they tell their own story. So that's, that was my inspiration from junk. People in my industry that I knew I wanted to work in, what did they do? Some people, you know, if you want to be a, a lawyer, a doctor in economics, it might make sense to follow the path that's been laid for you. But for us in tech, you know, at that time, me making applications and doing software and, you know, wanting to make the next operating system, wanting to make the next car OS, I didn't look at traditional schooling as my path to get there because I didn't have a lot of those examples. The examples that stood out to me were the ones that were the most popular, the ones that are easily, you know, understood and that didn't necessarily include traditional education. So I, I followed the path that was blazed, but with that same energy of always wanting to have, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then we'll definitely touch on that. Cause I've got a baby brother. I'm, people want to get sick of me. I talk about him like every other podcast. He getting ready to go to college. I wanted him to go to a community college first because you could, it's cheaper and you can get some certifications. But mm -hmm. since he don't want to do that, I'm going to try to help him out and we're going to, you know, try to get him an internship like his first year. Mm -hmm. So he's good if he wants to continue still doing school, you know, not be backwards like me. Like, I, like, like many people, like I was a first time college kid. So nobody had any way to like guide me. So I thought I wasn't supposed to go to the career fair you know, to my junior year, when in our actuality, I should have been going freshman year and just applying mm -hmm. to any internship I could have possibly get. But when you don't have no guidance, you know, that's what sets you back. There's a reason why, you know, you get, we get set back, you know, often, just even, in, you know, when you start in life. But not to go down that deep hole, I want to segue into something real quick because I want to see what your answer is going to be. Um, real quick, like, what's your uh, top five, I'm gonna say like Detroit rappers right now. They can either be currently in Detroit or been in Detroit, moved away. Um, they could be major top artists, five, underground top five artists. Of all time. Uh or or relevant right now. I guess we say we'll, we'll do two. We'll do we'll do your top five all time. Then we'll do like relevant right now. Top five all time. Number one, Blair Icewood. Uh, number two. Got to be Street Lord Wine. And then number three, KDZ. Uh, number four, Big Sean. And then number five. Ooh, that's a crazy one. You're talking about all time Detroit artists, bro. I might not even be able to go back to the city. Um, I'm going to toss Eminem up there, bro. Cause come I knew on, you was going to say that. I knew that's like the political. Wait, what time. you mean? Why you put M in there? I was like, mm. I was like man. And you okay. from Detroit? How many times y'all say, "Hey, put that new Eminem on"? Never. Exactly. But you know what he did for the city? He showed he showed people that they can they can blow. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and yeah, like yeah, without yeah. no okay. Eminem, it wouldn't have been no no shine. I mean, but let's be real. You got Jay Dilla. You got Proof. You got we got hitters out the city. But I gotta throw him up there just because he did maximize out. Of course, he's a white boy, so it is what it is. Like in our country, that matters. You get what I'm saying? So oh, yeah, definitely. he was able to do what he was able to do in our world, but he is from Detroit, so he got to be top five of all time. I'm trying to like top five no, right now. That's why you say like no Royce the five nine or something like that. Royce, Royce, he might make the list for right now. He not really okay. Even, he not off the table yet. You know what I'm saying? True. Um, you know, matter of fact, I would make Royce my number five. He he hard for right now. Like he he hard. So he my number five. My number four. For right now, I think four two Doug got got shit on fire. My number three right now, out the city, right now that's hot right now. Babyface Ray, mm -hmm. he he hot right now. Um, number two, and a lot of people probably not even go uh, agree with me for for placing him as number two. Now, I'm gonna say Dame Dot because Dame Dot he made a lot of sounds, he made a lot of moves. You know what I'm saying? He like the original, like he he born a rap. Like for real, for real. 
Okay. And then number one, out the city that's right now, out the city right now, number one. I wish I had the uh, Jeopardy music. <laughs> Damn, I don't even think we got a number one right now. It's too crazy. The city on fire, bro. We got Sada Baby. We got. That's what I thought you was going to. I'm surprised I ain't hear Sada Baby in the in the, either honorable mention or in the. In the top five, we got so many right now, bro. We got peas, we got ice wear, Vezo. We got too many to even do a five. It's not even fair. So, shout out to everybody that's doing music in Detroit. I remember, you know, being right there with DJ BJ. I used to be his brand manager from like 2008 to 2012 and in the trenches with a lot of these guys that you see. I met Cash Style, she came to the house. We met up with Ice Wear Vezo at the White Castle for his first mixtape ever. Um, Shout out to DJ Limelight. Is he on tour right now with, with Gucci Mane and Babyface Ray? Detroit, Detroit DJ. So, yeah, we on fire right now for music. Man, is Cash Doll really around our age? Cash Doll really around our age. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought she was like 34, 35. You know oh, what I'm saying? She really around our age. She, uh, but you know what? You're right, though. One of my um, shout out to my dog, uh, CJ Goodfella. Uh, Good fella sports TV on YouTube. He was telling me about he went to school with uh with Cash. So he from uh Detroit too. Uh so yeah. he said we she, all around she, the same age. She a, no, she a normal girl. Like Cash style, she uh, she real. You know what I'm saying? Like, she no, she look like a normal girl. Like I said, I'm able to like peep, like, like I said, certain different cities remind me of like women or men, like from you know, my city or whatnot. So I was like, I mean, uh yeah, she's a normal girl. Dude, I went to high school with actually is like uh one of her photographers. He's taking like a lot of pictures of her and stuff like that. So, man, the city, the Detroit got man, we got some it's ladies in Detroit. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to the ladies of Detroit. Right. And I just need, you know, I just need a little I just need the the organization of the lines to actually like do right so they can actually the lines? Oh, again. Man. Well when they not owned by the Fords, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's when that's I, when I, they go get better. Damn. But uh that's dope, man. Shout out to uh, Detroit, the Detroit rappers. I oftentimes think about because I, I, I got church background, right? So when a lot of times too, I think about Detroit, when you said Jay Dilla, I start thinking about Jay Drew, and then I start thinking about uh, the Shears and all them because mm, mm-hmm. he heavily influenced by Jay Dilla when he like made beats and stuff like that. Most certainly, actually, uh, friends with with the Shears, so yeah, they are definitely a staple of the city. Nice man. So real quick earlier, you told us about like your your software company, right? Just kind of like in a nutshell. But um, I want you a little bit, I guess, kind of like describe that process and like uh, if you're able to disclose, I guess, like maybe some things you worked on. It could be at a high level. I don't got to be like super um, detailed, I guess. But like, kind of like how that will come up, you know, come around, and you know, what did you guys do and how does how does one get like I don't know if you maybe guys so you sold them to like a big company or something like that but like how does that you know that process work? So um, started the company because I was uh, well for one in high school I was doing party promotions already so I was already I was like sixteen at the eighteen and ups type of deal. I was like 18 to 21 and ups type of deal. So like I always been, I always hung out with one generation that was older than me. Like my friends right now, they all graduated high school before I got to high school type of deal. Uh, I don't really got a lot of friends from high school. So they all throwing parties because that's what you do in, in college. That's what you do when you're 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So I'm with them because I want to make money. I understand the value of money. And I know what party promoting do for money a lot of money and, and having and entertainment and having a good time. So a lot of my friends, we were just making money that way. And um, that kind of was at the same time that that Detroit bubble was kind of happening. And it's 07, 08, Big Sean starting to pop. Um, and everybody want to be a rapper. So I started making websites for the local rappers. And then that turned into me making websites for the local DJs. Then that turned into me making websites for um, the radio DJs, the ones that's on the radio, on air, and then they sign projects. And then that turned into, you know, people just knowing me for doing websites uh, and me kind of increasing my social profile around just being a party promoter and doing websites, right? And funny enough, my boy BJ was like, you heard this cat? 
these are academics? I said, no, who is that? He said, bro, we need to be like academics. You need to be the next academics, bro. Just do it just like him. All right. So that's what I started to do. Uh, I started to like just follow people around and uh, do interviews and that type of stuff and put it up on, uh, on you know, DJ's website. Uh, so that was kind of like my introduction to just doing web development. Then at some point, people start saying, man, you know how to make apps? And me, being a hustler, I'm like, yep, yeah, I know how to make apps. We're going to make apps. So then I had to get a MacBook because people wanted iPhone apps. That was like the time iPhone 4 really had just came out and started to be like, you know, 4S was on the horizon. People want apps. Everybody want an app, right? Make me an Instagram. Make me a Facebook. Make me a Twitter. Make me a this. So then it became that. I started to just start dabbling in apps because people were requesting it. Um, and then from there, uh, I started to see that I, like, I'd already known a couple programming languages, but I started to see that I could make more money selling the apps and doing websites than I could doing party promotions. So I decided I wanted to step away from doing the promotions and just go full time on the apps. But then me stepping away from the promotions, man, I also stepped away from the party bus company. So I sold my equity in that, I stopped throwing parties, and I started to focus on just doing applications. Uh, I moved to downtown Detroit. Um, it was actually one of the cheaper places to live at the time. And I became a member of a co-working space. And in that co-working space, people are like, what do you do? I'm like, I make apps. And they're like, what's your portfolio? So I'm showing them apps that I've made, websites that I've made. You know, some of these people are like, oh, yeah, I listen to him on the radio. Or, you know, I remember that, that event or, you know, X, Y, Z. So then I started to, you know, meet people who needed my services. Oh, do a website for me. Or I'll run an ad agency. I'm looking for a web developer. Or I'm running for judge. I need another website. Um, and then that started to turn into, okay, I have an app idea. And I want you to build this app for me. So then I started to charge people $10,000 plus 25% of the company for their application. All right. Um, so then that's how I started making money. I stopped. It wasn't enough money you could pay me for a website. Most I could make on a website was 100 a page. Most people want four or five page websites. So it got to the point where four or $500 was cool. I was making, you know, two, three thousand dollars a month if I was hustling. All right, but I'm able to get these websites done in like two or three days. It would take me like ten dollars for a page, right? So basically, I'm like ten dollars an hour when you boil it all the way down. But that's how much web development costs. I started making app development, start charging ten thousand dollars for something that took three, four weeks to do. All right, now I'm starting to make twenty five hundred dollars a week for the same amount of work, and that I will make for a month's worth of work. I start making what I made in a, in a month in a week, right? So then from there, um, I started to get bigger customers because what happened is people would be impacted by applications that I would write and they would, you know, they either work somewhere or they know somebody or something. So then uh, eventually I ended up getting a relationship. Shout out to Jesse Dorsey. That's one of my guys. One of my right hand man. Uh, make a sound effect for him. Jesse Dorsey. That's, that's my dude. Um, Jesse got me an introduction with uh, General Motors and uh, GM. He over there. He he doing effectively. He hacking cars. He don't call it that, but he hacking cars, right? Um, he's calling it. We doing infotainment. <laughs> so this ended up being my biggest, like biggest thing that I did. Um, and long story short, uh, you know. This was before they had infotainment in cars. So I'm dating this, right? This 2013, 2012, 2013 and ish in that in that realm. Um and they um they don't know what they don't know. So they're trying to figure out, you know, we want to make apps. We want iHeartRadio. We want the Weather Channel. We want, you know, Pandora. These are applications that GM working with directly in the car. So what we did was we had this spec, this GIS spec. We just learned everything we could about the system, right? And mm -hmm. everything that was possible about the system. So then like these people who making the apps, they don't know everything that's possible. They just write maps and they're like, this is broken. And I'm like, oh, it's broken because this isn't allowed inside the system only. This is allowed in the system, right? But while I was there, I learned so much about writing specs, reading specs, architecture, wireless, LAN, just, everything the way that a browser loads a page the way that telecommunications telecommunications work the way that you debug and grab console logs off of a car 
the way that cars are wired, just right, learn so much stuff. Um, and in that role, um, because of the nature of what I was doing, I started to get a little bit deeper with reverse engineering and hacking. I, I needed to understand how things worked at a deeper level, right? Not to mention, in prior in my prior uh, you know role, um, I've had customers that have been breached, things that I've had to patch, that type of stuff. So I was aware of it. I actually started a company called Cryptic, but I just didn't really know where to start with cybersecurity. So I was kind of focused on software. Um, but at the same time, I started to look at more like in-person tools, key logging tools, Wi-Fi pineapples, those types of things. Because um, everything before then had been like web shells. Right. So, um, you know, now I know how to reverse engineer things. I know how to, you know, read binaries and pull secrets out of files and this type of stuff. And I found vulnerabilities inside of these cars, inside this infotainment system that I've been able to report. I've worked with GM security. I've learned how to punch holes out of a firewall and come back in and, and domain front and put things out on the edge from within their, their host, I mean, within their network, even though they're not supposed to. Um, that, like, I'm getting to advanced level things, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I go to a hackathon, and uh, this is just, you know, a hackathon place where you come up with different app ideas. This was a place that I used to frequent. I used to always go to hackathons and make apps. Um, and then a friend of mine was working for General uh, General Electric. Now I'm working for GM. He working for GE. My boy Paul Erickson. Shout out to Paul Erickson. He another one we got a shout out. That's my guy. I talked to him today. Um, and power of networking, man. The power of knowing somebody. That's what all of this is boiling down to. Me being exposed to knowing people and taking advantage of opening my mouth and taking risks and failing, right? Nevertheless, um, I get a bet. Oh, man, I bet you can't, uh, you know, beat this, this capture the flag. I'm like, ah, but I beat it. Smash it. He's like, oh, it's for college students. I knew you would beat it. I'm surprised you didn't hack the thing that it was running on. I'm like, is that a challenge? He's like, yeah. So the system that it was running on was a Mac Pro. Mind you, I told you, I know about like this Wi-Fi pineapple stuff, these key loggers, land turtles, mm -hmm. all this shit, right? So it's sitting there. I'm just like, bro, I bet you, I bet you I could get that computer to connect to my computer. It was a reverse shell. We just got to be on the same network. And I'm on the same network because I signed up for the capture the flag. Right. Now, I understand IP addresses enough. I understand routing enough. So I'm, you know, okay. I know how to, you know, I know how this works. I know the IP address of the server and everything, right? So I get a payload written for my rubber ducky and I put it onto that box, right? And it fires off and it gives me the reverse shell. Ooh, I catch it. I know, and I got witnesses, right? I got homies who just there with me. They're not really, they not really knowing like what I know how to do. Like they just <laughs> hanging out with me. They just my friends. We up there, they just starting to get exposed to this whole world that I'm dragging them in. He's some cats from Detroit. I'm just right. dragging them into my world. Now, next thing you know, I done hacked the computer. They like, what you hacked? I'm like, yeah, I can make it say stuff, you know. All types of stuff because you know on Max you can make it speak. You can just say speak, mm -hmm. it'll speak, right? Um, so I get nervous. I close my computer. I'm out. I leave the <laughs> hacking. The next morning I hit up you my boy. Got a call or something, huh? Man, I, I got nervous, right? The next morning I wake up. I text my bro, my bro Paul. I'm like, yo, I did end up hacking that that, that, that capture the flag box. FYI, he's like, oh, thank God that was you. The payload was found. We shut down to capture the flag. We didn't know what was going on. We thought we were under attack. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, that was me. Ooh, he like, okay. Um, so next thing you know, the next day is a Monday because that was a Saturday. And the next day was a Sunday when I let him know. The next day is a Monday. And I'm like doing memory testing on head units, which is terrible. I hate you guys press buttons and wait for it to crash. It was just terrible, right? I get a call from my bro, Paul. I'm like, yo, what's going on? He's like, yeah. Um, he's like, I had a really long day. I'm like, what you mean? He's like, yeah. Like, you know, we had to do forensics and then we had to reach out to our partners at the FBI. And I'm like, for what? And he's like, for, you know, your payload. You know, the host that it was running on, we had to make sure it wasn't like, 
you're not aligned with anybody. Like it was all on the up and up. There was no data X field. Like I'm like, man, I'm getting sold up the river right now. Like, what you mean? Like you had to work with your agents and you got forensics and I'm I'm getting scared, right? He's like, Yeah, man, my boss wants to talk to you. I'm like, fuck no, I do not want to talk to your boss. Like he's like, No, <laughs> just trust me. Like, I think it'll be it'll be good for you. Just talk to him. I'm like, okay, whatever. So give him my number. He said, okay. So I go back to testing my phone, ring immediately. So I leave back out for testing. Yep. Is it Xavier? Yeah, Xavier Johnson? Yeah. Um, Paul told me a lot about you. I said, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, he said, what are you doing these days? So I told him, I'm like, man, I'm over here car hacking. Like, it's big as fun. But today, I'm not really liking what I, I got to do memory testing. He's like, mm. It's like, you know, uh, you know, my boss is pretty upset that you did that. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, like General Electric is not one of the kind of places where we take kindly to being, you know, breached unannounced. And like, he started to use like this really strong language, right? Um, he was like, you know, basically he was telling me he, they may have to take legal action if I didn't cooperate with them. Right? And I was like, man, okay, like, what, what, you know, what's the remedy? Like, what exactly is the, uh, like, how do I, how do I fix this? Like, what is what is it that you want? He says, um, take a couple of days off and come to the uh, G the GE office, right? I said, okay. So I went to the GE office. I took a couple of days off. I went to the GE office. Um, I met with all these different people. The whole time, I didn't realize I was getting interviewed. <laughs> I met with all these different people. So they kind of like kind of scare tactic you into interviewing. Yeah, them? they kind of scare tactic. Right. So then next thing you know, everybody, I met directors, I met VPs, I met all these what? different people, teammates, What? Um, all these different, these different people, right. Over these next two days, I'm talking about like interviews and they're like asking me, you know, about my ethical and my moral compass and like what my background was and where I'm from and what do I like to do? How do I go? How would I solve this problem? They were like, I'm, I'm thinking this is so that they, I can show them my moral character so that they don't prosecute me or like anything mm-hmm. like that i'm thinking like okay let me just make let me make friends right also it's ge and these are all paul friends and he work here so i'm about to make some friends too like i'm a businessman i know what friends do right so um next thing you know i get a uh an offer from the uh the, the manager over at general electric um but it comes with one stipulation and that's that i have to uh you know, sign a non compete, and I have to work directly for them. And I can't. So you can't work with GM at the time. Can't work with GM, right? I wonder, but just to kind of time out right there, like, ain't they kind of owned by the same people, or they not? No, they're not. Because I've always felt like General Motors and General Electric, you know, are affiliated. But that could just be my ignorance. But I just always felt like the general, like, no, they was aligned in some sort of fashion. They're not. They never been aligned. So. um General Electric was actually founded by um, ooh, JP Morgan and Word. Thomas Edison. Crazy. I work for them now. <laughs> JP Morgan and Thomas, Thomas Edison got together and started General Electric. Um, the JP Morgan, the Thomas Edison. Like they actually have the light bulb, they have the patent to the light bulb, General Electric. Um, nice. They have the patent to. Um, and they, them people don't ever have to work again, bro. No, never. They have <laughs> the patent to the uh, the camera, to like the photo lens, the, all types of stuff. Like they're yeah. interesting, very interesting company, industrial company, right? So I looked at it as an opportunity. One of the things was that I had to get rid of my company. They helped me find a buyer for the company. Um, oh, so that's how that happened. How? Yeah. And, and briefly, okay. So let's get into. Let me see if I got a. Uh, I got a sound for this or whatever. I might just play this. I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> Real quick, like that had to be a good offer for you to sell all that. So, like, what did they buy it for? And then what was your offer like in order for you to decide to hang up stuff where you could just pretty much control however much you want to make to go work for them? The contract I worked on over at General Motors was like one point seven million. Um, so they they knew that they saw that as a, a line item. Um, so it is it, an undisclosable amount um, mm-hmm. thanks to contracts, but right. it was north of that number. 
So was that what the whole thing was funded or was that what you was getting paid? Uh, that was basic. So I did have some investors at the time that I had to pay back um, because gotcha. I was a little bit leveraged trying to do the GM, the G, uh, the GM deal. Um, and so there was some some payback there. But yeah, like the, the whole thing was was more than one seven because um, that was like my floor. I'm like, listen, it doesn't make sense. Um, but then they also kept that that company running. Um, it kept that contract. They kept that team together. That was all a part of everything. It was like I can't just sell this but, and let everything go. Like it has to right. be sold, and they have somebody's gonna take care of it. Yeah, in order. Um, but I just relinquished my equity. There were some people that were in my life that kept their equity. I think still have equity in the company. Um, I believe the company's still running. So nice. That's that's dope, man. Because I mean, even me. I don't hear these stories. So I was actually that because I was like, I never know who's going to watch or listen to this. So it's like, it might be like a, a young cat out there right now that's probably thinking about going with his move and like, you know, what to do when they, you know, caught in those type of positions. So that's pretty dope, man. Like, aim for know, the stars, man. Right. Man right. Right. Exactly. Like, every, I don't know, like my guests lately have like everybody has put like, took a piece of games for them, like, just in all different ways to figure out like, what I can do with it for my own self. So that's why I like to have these conversations. Uh, so if, if we get back into the, the GE thing, like how long uh, were you working with them? Cause I know you kind of pretty much did like a lot of different companies that you started like just doing stuff at like, what, what, what was that time frame? Was that like a span of like, you know, five years where you just start doing your thing for that all was, these big companies? That was fun. Um, yeah, it was, Maybe about five years, yeah. Um, between GM, I think I spent like two, two and a half years there, maybe three years or so. Um, yeah, I think closer to like three, three and a half years. And then I was over at Gen General Electric for eight months. Um, when I went there, the next month they got a new CEO, and then at the end of that fiscal oh, no, year, no. the end of that fiscal year, they fired him. He was like the the CEO of healthcare, and then when they fired him, they let go of like a whole bunch of other people. Now I had an opportunity because I was the man there. They like, listen, we want you. Like, don't even worry. You got to move down to Atlanta though. And I'm like, Atlanta. I'm like, man, I'm not about to move to Atlanta, bro. Like, man, you ain't want to move to Atlanta, man. Nah, the girl I was with at the time, I was I like, ah, I'm not about to even. I'm going to just stay here in Detroit, man. Like, I got all my everything here. You got to think, man. Everything been made out the mud here. Now you're telling me I got to go somewhere else where it's like, I'm not even rare in Atlanta. Everybody young, black, getting it with tech money. Like, I'm just another person in Atlanta. But here in Detroit, well, I'm actually like, I'm somebody in Detroit. Like, I don't well, I ain't going to lie, though. They is, but we know men got a, a advantage in, in atlanta man just because mm -hmm. of you know how that is that's all say it on the podcast okay. but um but uh that's cool uh so you was there eight months and then where'd you go after the eight months yeah so then um they gave me a man they gave me a, i was making the most money in my life at that phase right i mean maybe right now i make that like with that that amount of money comparably but they gave me a huge um I don't even know what you call it because I never got one before. But basically, we sorry for hiring you and firing you. A severance. They gave me, yeah, severance. Man, I'm talking about like it was amazing. I got like how, all kind of. Money how much was that? Life. Like how many months severance was it? A year. It was like I was working. I I made a I made um a salary from GE for a okay. year as long as I remained unemployed. All right. I got like a year salary on top of like some other weird CRC bonus. It was just money coming out of nowhere. Like man, what the I was man? Listen. Taking. We need, we need this exclusive for the for the Patreon, man. What 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 are we talking, man? What are we talking? Oh, about? what you what you mean for, at that phase? Um, if, if you broke it down per month, like you know, what what are we talking that that, oh, that would probably um, equate it to? Uh, if we break it down per month, it was. Or you can do a year, or you can do like whatever it is, like annually. What 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 that look like? Man? You talking about just the severance? Yeah, just just the oh, severance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the severance. The severance. Was about twenty thousand dollars a month. Yeah, man. And so immediately, I'm, I'm like, "Listen, I'm not going to go work a job immediately. Like, I'm about to." I, I don't blame it's you. A, it's a lick right now, right? So I went back into entrepreneurship. But as did you get some more buffs, man? That listen, I, I bought my second pair of buffs. 
that year. Mm-hmm. I bought, Shout I out to Murder Wild. Pain. <laughs> <laughs> That's my you movie right there, buffed to, up. Um, man, I was staying in the penthouse in Detroit off the river with a wraparound balcony. Life was sweet. I had got a brand new uh, Dodge Durango, 2018 RT thing. It was it was nasty, man. I was I was enjoying life. Um, I don't think I own no shoes that you even had to tie up. Like it was, everything was sweet and smooth sailing. And from that moment, um, I went and I started to work as a contractor for uh, a company in Iowa, just an unknown company, but they had so many customers like Allstate, MLB, NHL. Um, the Hearst family. So I got on uh, a contract with the Hearst family. And, you know, if you don't know who they are, they own a lot of multimedia, um, huge magazine conglomerate, um, one family based out of New York. And I started to make the identity and access management single sign-on solutions for Cigar Aficionado, Wine Spectator. I mean, like, we were seeing tens of millions of login authentication attempts over months. So um yeah like that was my my shift out of corporate back into like uh like consulting and then so what are you doing time. and sorry i'm actually like i'm look, I'm, I'm i'm talking to you like i'm talking to you on the phone so i can get the game so was was that what you would call like a company to company when you were working with them uh i was doing 1099 for my person i was doing uh i was it was just an independent contractor i wasn't okay. i didn't have another corporation filed yet like gotcha. i got laid i got laid off from GE in December, they gave me two months to wrap up all my affairs there. So by like the end, mid, middle end of February, I had already had another role just as a contractor. But I was getting that severance pay at the same time. So yeah, I was, was double sure. dipping. And that's uh-huh. really important for people to understand. I'm in Detroit. The average income in Detroit is, is 40 something, maybe under 40,000. So the, my it ain't nowhere you can go to spend this money. It's not a Gucci. It's not a Louis. It's not a St. Laurent around. It's not no amusement parks. You know, the only thing you really can do is buy a car. And I'm I'm set there, right? So Mm -hmm. I'm putting this money away. I'm stacking money, right? Um, And that was really important for my next phase, which was, for one, I went back into corporate for a little bit. I spent some time over at Dynatrace, which... um, you know, that, that stopped my severance pay, but it was just shy of when it was going to stop anyway. Um, and then I was over at Dynatrace for a while, maybe two years. And while I was there, what I was able to convince them to do, because they hired me as a DevOps engineer. And I said, listen, I really do security. I've been doing all this hacking, X, Y, Z. My boy, Paul, the one who put me in at GE, well, he was sad to see everything that went down. He had already left GE. So he pulled me into Dynatrace, right? I'd never been hired from my resume. I am a key hey, and right, and that's what I tell people now. It's like networking. Like I think I just said on the, the episode that's gonna drop uh, tomorrow. I was just like, once you get that network, like you really got to interview. Like if you make the type of friends you need to make, and really? they hire up, then like, hey, I know him. He been doing this for whatever amount. Of, just hire mm-hmm. him. And if that person good got good standing with the company and they about their business, you, you don't got to worry about here. nothing. You're gonna be right in. So, so I had that going for me too. So I came in. I got, I got my own bag, right? So I'm, I'm at this point. I'm living, on, I'm living at another spot off the water. You get what I'm saying? I got my own money. I got computers and gadgets and toys. I'm traveling. We going scuba diving. I'm buying watches. Oh, so it's like I, the people that I I'm seen the Rolly. I'm at, I seen the Rolly the other day on the store. You know, what I mean? come on now. So, so the people that I'm at work with. <laughs> They like, man, you successful. I'm like, yeah, I've, I've been doing this since I was 12. Give me an opportunity to talk. So then I start making friends there that was based in Detroit, that was older than me, but they worked for the company that was big in Detroit before me, which was CompuWare. You don't remember I heard about Detroit. them before. Used to be a I heard big tech hub there called CompuWare, right? And we still had something called the CompuWare building. It's in the center of our downtown, Peter Carmano's was like this huge, before Dan Gilbert, he was the one, right? Um, so these people come from mainframes and they come from all of this other, like this background. And so I started to kick it with them and skill up on things that I didn't know. Like I was really good at cloud, but they were really good at on-premise. So I would give them cloud knowledge and they would give me and on-prem on premise knowledge. Queer pro quo. Man. So then I started to build these networks, like you can see right here at my house, start having them over, started to learn different things. 
Um, and then that was really good for me, right? And and through that, um, because I started to build so much of that that social net that social relationship, they didn't care what I did at work. I made my own work at work. So I just said, okay, Paul, who used to be my peer, became my boss. I empowered him as my boss. I always wanted to make Paul look good, no matter what. Always make your boss look good. Never outshine the master, right? Hey, so you've been on it. You've been reading. <laughs> come on now. So, so I'm making Paul look good. So I say, Paul, you know what's going to look really good? He said, well, I say, everybody here do the exact same thing. He said, yeah, I said, except for I do security too. I said, okay, yeah. So give me all the security work. I say, let's go find all the security work. Okay. I go and I find all the security work. I assign it to me. I get it done. I work with all the different teams. I use my social equity to be able to do what effectively people don't like to do, which is security work, betterment, fixing something that they already did already. They don't want to go back and touch that, right? Um, managing the key, changing the password, something. It's always a chore, right? So it became like when Xavier is approaching you, he's got a certain tenacity and a reason, and he's justifying it, and he's got a whole list of things. We just asked you to do this one thing for right now kind of deal, right? So then I learned how to leverage my relationships to be able to get security work done. And through that, through learning how to, you know, leverage my, my personal network, learning how to leverage my prof professional network, I decided that I wanted to do more content. So I started a show called How They Got Hacked. It was me, my boy Mo, and my boy Tom Lawrence, who's on YouTube, right? Um, so we all got together and we started doing How They Got Hacked. Then that started to raise my outside of professional and personal profile, like the random profile, right? Um, so then what that started to do is people start coming to me for advice and things that they need. So I said, okay, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to start a consulting company. And that's how I started enterprise offensive security and enterprise defensive security, because that's what I was already doing. I was working in an enterprise doing offensive and defensive security. I was going to London. I was going to Gdansk. I was going to Linz, Austria, Frankfurt, Germany, all of these different places for cybersecurity, like to help people with their cyber, right? So um, I started a consultancy. It was very, very small when I first started it. I got a couple of customers just from YouTube, and then I ended up getting my first big, big customer, which was Kivu Consulting. Dope, dope, man, dope. Because, like, I've always wondered, like, if I want to go that route, like, because what you said, you've been answering questions I never had to ask. Like, I always ask people, like, networking and marketing yourself, like, the same way, like, me starting this is, like, you know, help me branch out to just different people who have just tuned in and opportunities have come my way, you know. A lot of people think you have to have, you know, some big massive following or whatever, you know, to get noticed. I'm like, nah, if your content is good enough and you seem to be a person that know what you're talking about, they'll find you. So don't really chase the the whack stuff that I see on YouTube with all the clickbait and stuff that's no substance. Or even if you're doing blogs or podcasts, like make it have some integrity, make it have some value, and then that's going to help you out, you know, in the long run. Because think about it. You say you never interview. Technically, I don't have to interview you. You can just go through and listen to my me talk on my content. I got like almost like doing this with this specific YouTube page for like two years now. Uh, you can just go there and listen to that. So that's pretty dope you said that. And then also about how that was, you know, able to get you clients. Cause I think that's a lot of times why fear, you know, of like of doing like your own thing. It's like how to market. Like even right now, like me being like career coach, which I'm probably gonna transition now that eventually, but like, you know, when I started, I was like, hmm, how do I start this? And I just started pretty much I did a lot of stuff like for free in the beginning. Just to showcase, you know, I knew what I was doing. And then I could start showing people, hey, look what I did. Blah, blah, blah. So over time, like, it just picked up. And now, combined with this and the podcast and everything else, people already know. And I got proof. And I believe, like, uh, I never saw the channel you talking about. But I believe, like, they already seen the proof of what you knew how to do. And you probably had already talked about the things you did. So that's like, oh, we need to get, we need this guy, you know, to fix our stuff for us. Right. Right. And that's basically what it came down to. I, I was doing a show called How They Got Hacked, and it was all around incident response and like people, you know, breaking down the latest attacks. Right. So we will find an attack that was coming out on a Friday and we will break it down. This is how this typically happens. X, Y, Z. Right. These are the tools that's used. Here's the, the tools. Techniques and is that still up right, right now? 
you can go you can go to YouTube and type in how they got hacked. Yeah, we got our own channel. There's a bunch on uh, Lawrence Systems as well. Uh, we've been on hiatus since the pandemic. Um, and there's also like some logistic things that have changed oh, since the, the pandemic started. But um, yeah, I don't know if you need a podcast manager. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, that's what I'm but, um, but no, I'm just saying, I think that's something that's probably, probably, I don't know when, I can't, I don't know when like Darknet Diaries actually popped off or started, but that seems like a little bit with a twist, um, you know, like opposed a, a, a to like a Darknet Diaries, but it seemed like they're kind of like in that same realm of things like and like, that dude, and I've never checked y'all stuff out, so I'm just going off of what I've heard a couple of times I listen to Dark Knight Diaries, but he know how to make <laughs> the stuff sound like super interesting, the production, the music and stuff like that. Yeah, like you, we, you we, feeling it. We not at that level. Um, we, we're we more like uh, weekly, so it's fresh. So it's like- Oh yeah, you know, yeah, it's harder to week. do that. Like his stuff is like, I remember like he was touching on like the old like LinkedIn breach one time. So mm-hmm. he'll go back and redo some old stuff, but that's dope, man, because I mean, all that content is needed. I know like a couple of times I, my computer was tripping the last time I tried to do it, but like, I like to, from time to time, like just go through some uh, different attacks or something that's happening, like on bleeping computer or something, like make people mm-hmm. aware. Like, I think I did like a podcast episode about like how Robin Hood got hacked and what I actually thought happened from what I just read from what they wrote down. Cause we all know mm-hmm. most of the stuff they write down is like just PR Good stuff. Shit. Like it's some negligence. Nine times out of 10, somebody got breached off of negligence. The tool alerted them. I know for a fact. You see it all the time. One hundred percent. And speaking of which, I got a tool that alerts people of these types of things. <laughs> nice. Uh, let's talk about that, man. Let's talk about we help you secure. Let's talk about that. And you know, if y'all listening right now and you need, you know, your company secure, hey, this the this the time to you know go ahead and listen right now. Yep. We help you secure. It's the name of my business. Uh, originally known as Enterprise Offensive Security. Um, and I, I kind of was kind of leading into that, right? So my first big, big customer, um, we went in, it was uh, two of us full-time working with them as traditionally an incident response group. And they had found us through our content because you know we were breaking down the latest breaches. So yeah, kind of had some, some understanding of emerging threats as they were coming out. Um, and so we were applying those same tools, techniques, and procedures to their customers so that they could verify that their environments wouldn't succumb to, you know, these types of threats. So that was our first big partnership. And then from there, it was kind of like a slow roll where we got like another customer and they was like a one-off and we get a customer that wants like a year's worth of work. Then we get a customer, eventually we end up getting a customer that wanted seven years worth of work. Right. So, um, those are those are big government uh, contracts where it's like, hey, the state of Illinois wants you to do all of the public schools, right? Nice. And that becomes something that's really really large. You touch it two or three times a year, but then you don't really, you know, you spin back around another three months, four months later, and then touch it again, kind of thing. Right. Um, but yeah, so that's that's that was kind of like the beginning. And over that time, I was developing a tool that uses AI and more more than less um, machine learning to be able to um, identify assets that are exposed out on the external network. And so what I can do is based on uh, understanding of your business and what assets you own, we can map them out over the entire internet. And then we can tell you where services are exposed, where ports are exposed, how vulnerable you are. And to some level uh, uh, automatically penetrate your environment based on the availability of exploits or the understanding of our of our system, right? Um, and then what this does is uh, we sell this quarterly and yearly. And what this does is every single day it goes through and it looks and checks for your exposures, S3 buckets, databases, dangling domains, insecure DNS, everything that it possibly can, it goes out and it finds every day. And then once a week, it generates a report and sends it to you. And then once a month, you get to speak with somebody from our organization to go over your results with you, a customer success manager to, to make sure, hey, you know, we found that more and more RDP is coming onto the edge. Maybe you have a misconfiguration somewhere or, hey, we've seen that RDP has gone down and you've eradicated the use of that. But your VPN gateway is vulnerable to this, but it's just a medium. So you should patch it over the next three months because of this risk, right? 
and then we like we're actually helping you interpret the results and then once a quarter uh, since we sell this quarterly you get a manual penetration test where we'll go through and we'll send a human at it and we'll make sure that not only uh, were we able to validate that there are no exposures based on the data that we know but we actually generate new data um, based on kind of our human approach right um, and so you get all of that wrapped in so that's um, you know 12 weekly reports three months monthly touch bases and uh, one manual penetration test and uh, you get all that for 12,500 now typically our engagements are on average are twenty thousand dollars and that's for a two-week penetration test so uh, we've been able to through uh, tooling and through wanting to work with customers on a longer term basis, we're able to cut our prices down knowing that not only can we help you, but we can leverage technology to be able to do kind of some of the mundane things and then and just really focus do. on, you know, the things that will be extremely critical versus, you know, this once in a while generation of all this data, right? And of right. course, the more of it you buy, the greater the discount. So if you buy it annually, I think right now we're doing 20% off. So that's a that's little smart. bit of what we got going on over at We Help You Secure. Our, our emphasis is help. Um, and because of that, and because of me acknowledging my background and where I come from, um, we founded a nonprofit. It's called the We Help You Secure Academy. And what that does is it takes 10 lucky people for now, just 10, um, and it takes them out of their traditional role and it trains them up on cybersecurity. So our goal is to make them like an ethical hacker or a mediation specialist um, or just a really, really good security engineer, DevSecOps engineer, uh, operations engineer, those types of things, right? And um, because of their skill set at the end of our uh, cohort, the goal is to get them all certified. And through certification, they'll come and work directly for my organization for two years, right? So they'll come and work for We Help You Secure where they'll either be running these scans or they'll be doing manual penetration testing or they'll be doing remediation work or you know generating policies or doing cloud security or whatever it is that we fit them into based on the workflow that we have um, and so that's our big kind of give back but it also solves our problem of being able to hire qualified uh, operators as well so um, nice you know that's that's my mission man to be able to make some money have some fun help some people um, but then also be able to give back and, and help the general public. Man, that's dope. Uh, I had a couple of questions because I was like, man, this man just got a tool that's doing vulnerability management, risk management, uh, uh, risk assessments. Like I was like, man, that's that's cool because any tool that solves problems is always going to be beneficial, right? Some people try to invent stuff that, that you really don't need, but something that somebody needs. And especially we know like, there's still a whole bunch of like smaller businesses that can't, you know, even sometimes even afford that stuff. So your model is affordable to, you know, companies that, you know, generally speaking, wouldn't be able to afford, you know, any type of cybersecurity like type of coverage. So that's dope. But I had some questions as far as like the tool when you're talking about it. Do you have any type of demo type of slides like no type of you know client information on or anything but like something yeah. that's just regular that you send because i would love to make that b-roll when you start talking about that and just putting it on the screen that way people kind of you know see that uh, Most certainly. and then about your nonprofit, like uh, are y'all done accepting applicants or uh what's the process on that so for the nonprofit, it'll be 100 percent detroit based you'll need to be a detroit resident <laughs> and and then uh, there'll be a interview and selection process that we work through. Um, as of right now, our first cohort is looking like Q1 of 2023. Uh, we're going, we're in our formation stage right now. Uh, location uh, procurement will be happening throughout the summer. Uh, hopefully have that done by fall. And then we'll be uh, spending Q4 just uh, renovating the space. Uh, we already have our curriculum generated uh, and we already have our instructors selected. So um, gotcha. I think uh, Q3, Q4, you'll probably be hearing more about it because it'll be ramping up um, and we'll be accepting applications, but you will need to be in Detroit or the Metro Detroit area, but preferably uh, a Detroit, a city of Detroit citizen. Um, right, because I sure was uh, going to say like, because you'd be like Detroit adjacent, because I got somebody in mind, you know, that possibly would uh, 
could be like a, a good fit for y'all. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll, accept, I'll accept somebody from Detroit or Jason. Let, let's be transparent here. The goal is to help people, but right. I know that my city, my city needs some help. And I just want to be the one to help them. That's it. That's, that's fire, though, because we need, you know, I, I see that. I see, like, a lot of companies, like this company, uh, uh, technically I signed the stuff, but I haven't made an announcement yet with them. But uh, I'll be partnering and working with them on some things. And they do typical kind of same things, like far as like offering consulting boot camps, having you know the people that come through the boot camps, they hire them so they can consult for them for whatever time, so they get real experience and then right. they can go on about their way. So, man, that's that's dope, man. Like this was you know this was enlightening. You know, I'm I'm probably gonna like do a pre roll to all this. Is like, man, you need to get like your popcorn, your chips, and everything ready, your notepad, and, and, and take out notes. Um. We're gonna. I'm gonna probably. Let me see some. Let me let me find us some like, really quick, some outro music. Cause I I want to see like if you had like three things like you wanted to leave like you know the viewers with like what would it be? Uh, let's see what we got. Three things that I will leave the viewers with. Let me see what we got. Let me see if we can. Just... Can you hear that? I'll get here now. Okay. Yeah, if you had three things you can lead the viewers with, like, you know, as far as it, simple as life or whatever, you know, like, kind of what would that be? Um, first thing is I get some free game. My, my god mom told me, and it stuck with me for forever. It stick with me to this day. Um, dream as big as possible. Because dreams are free. So there's no like limit on your dreams. Like you, nobody's charging you money for them. So dream as big as possible. Um, I think the next thing that I, I really, really think that people should <clears throat> consider and continuously live through is um, you got to work just as much as you're faithful. So um Faith without work is dead. Like you have to put the work in. And I know, you know, you're gonna look at your peers next to you, but you don't you may not know their story. You may not know where they come from, their background. They may have just started before you. But if you look at every day as an opportunity to grow, learn, and better yourself, then you'll be able to align yourself with people who have that same mantra and learn from them and with them. Um, and I think the last thing that I I mean in that same vein is the last thing I'll say is meet people. Uh, network with people, be open-minded, love people, um, allow yourself to be heartbroken. It's better to have uh, loved and been hurt to have, than to have never loved at all. So I would rather give you all the game that I got. I'd rather give you all the money I got. I'd rather give you all of my resources and you run off with it and never, and never acknowledge me than for me just to be selfish and never share that with you and end up losing all those relationships regardless. So, um, you know, love one another. Um, that's that's the that's my main thing. Man, I appreciate that, man. Um, you want to tell the people where they could, uh, you know, either reach out to you or follow you at? Yeah. So, please go to my website, wehelpyousecure.com. Follow me on Instagram, uh, Xavier underscore Johnson. The business is at We Help You Secure. Uh, please like my page on LinkedIn. We help you secure. Um, I have a sample report that is downloadable on the website. I have a booking link on the website. I also have a contact form. You can reach out to me through any one of those. I also have a hotline on the website. So you can pick up the phone and call me at any time. Um, if you'd like to get on my calendar, uh, just go ahead and click the get started button. And then there's a calendar link directly there for you just to put yourself on my calendar. And then we can have a discussion about your needs, your projects, etc. Man, that's dope, man. You guys all know where you can follow me at. It's textual chatter. Pretty much on all my social medias. I appreciate y'all. You know, y'all been really supporting the podcast. Keep on supporting. Leave us a good rating. And if you're on YouTube, leave us a comment. Share it out for the YouTube algorithm. But, you know, until next time, let's stay textual.